uh, researchers at Columbia University did another, released another new study that confirms what we pretty much already know, or at least what most of us know and agree to. Uh, there are some of us among us that obviously don't. Um, that shows that, of course, government programs like food stamps and unemployment insurance have actually helped raise a significant number of people out of poverty over the last 50 years. Now, conversely, in the same study, it shows that a deregulating uh, d the deregulated crony capitalism that we have has hasn't done anything to help the poor um, at all during that same amount of time so I want to get everybody's uh, um, of course reaction to this after I give you a couple of the numbers um, according to the report uh, in the Washington Post the safety net actually helped reduce the percentage of Americans in poverty from 26% in 1967 to 16% in 2012. Now that's a that's a pretty pretty good drop, I should say, for a lot of these um, a lot of these programs. Now conservatives love to say that oh you're just promoting dependency, you're just you know wasting all that money, but it has an actual profound effect according to these studies. So now. Once I've got that, I want to uh, head it out to the panel and see what you guys think. All right. So the the metaphor I like to use for this is um, is the guy who jumped in front of the parade and then he takes a selfie and he acts like the whole parade was caused by him when he really just got in front of it. If you look at the uh, numbers of Americans living in un, in poverty, they only started keeping those numbers in 1958. But in 1959, when they were released, poverty was around 22 percent. And in 64, when these programs like really began to start, it already had gone down to 19%. So poverty was already going down before the war on poverty. And after a couple, after the first 13 years, it kind of just, or after the first decade or nine years, it kind of just stabilized. Like after the 70s, our poverty rate has been from 11 to 15% all the way. So Sean, so let, let, no let's, way let's to... look at that. You said uh, you, you cited back in the 1960s, right, when it started to change. What, what was going on in the I have here? And it says it's at 22.4%, and it had fallen to 19% in 1964. So it already had fallen about 3%, which makes sense to me because the economy was growing. Right, and that makes sense. So after the, the 70s, after the 70s and the 80s, when Reaganomics and deregulation started, it became static. That's what you just said. So what you're saying no, is what I'm saying, what I'm saying <laughs> whenever is, libertarian policies took over, it stopped working. Go figure. Boom. I, what, I, well, no. First of all, Reagan was no was no man's libertarian. What I'm saying is that poverty was going down before the war on poverty. That's just a that's just a fact. Like they and started it keeping numbers in '59 after the war on poverty too. Yeah, but it was already going down. It's like it's like when OSHA was created, work, workplace accidents were already going down. We were becoming a less manufacturing economy with less people in, in the parts. People like workplace accidents were already going down, and then OSHA comes in, and then workplace accidents go down for like five to ten years after that, and then they're and then they're like, oh, look what OSHA did. But you got to look at the rest of the chart. It was already falling. All right. It doesn't uh, mean that those that those social programs haven't had any effect, too. So so you're also trying to just say that. No, no, it, it wasn't just it wasn't the social programs that helped either. It was just going to go down anyway, which I don't buy. I don't buy that at all. I think that you're right in pointing out that there was a there there was a decline. Yes, because of a good economy. A good economy uh, economy tends to lift a lot of people up, right? But then you've also got these social programs that also had quite an impact as well. Right, and and from what what I'm looking at here. The biggest impact of these programs were in two major groups, and the first one should not surprise anybody. It's for the elderly. I think elderly poverty was cut by in a half or or close to two thirds after this why, after sixty four to now, which makes sense because need, that's why we need to retain social social security and not touch it. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying that not makes that make that makes sense because Medicare was invented in the sixties, and you get three times out of Medicare what you put in, so. Like, I would assume that elderly poverty declined. But from 18 to 64, from what I have here, it dropped from 10.5% to 10.1%. So, like, if you're 18 to 64, 
then or to 64, then there's not really that much of a change. Some for children because a lot of the benefits you get from SNAP are given to parents, and you get more benefits if you have kids. So there's like a, a, a decline in children and a massive decline in elderly, which makes perfect sense. But the Great Society programs for your 18 to 24s really had no major effect. Because there was no... But, that, but that's... No, 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 no. There was no major, uh, like, for for that demographic. So, okay, so you're saying uh, it worked great for kids and it worked great for the elderly. It didn't work great for the middle. Therefore, it doesn't work. Right. That, 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 that's well, not, not logical. I mean, like Michael said, it wasn't targeted so much at the middle. Now, there is some of it that is. I'm not trying to deny that. But the idea of it is to help those who can't help themselves. That's the elderly and the young. The 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 broader the broader picture was that was this. It was it was that the the poor people will always be with us. Jesus said that. And he's right. Poor people will always be with us. The 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 idea to have a war on poverty is about as dumb as about having a, a war on drugs. It just it, it it's it's not a it's not a viable option. If you want to have targeted programs to support the elderly and the needy, that's more along the lines of what you need to do. It, it's a balancing act, guys. So you have to focus on, okay, who's hurting the most? And who's hurting the least? And if we're going to take it in today's terms, who's hurting the most? The middle class. Who's hurting the least? The rich. So take the money from the rich and give it to the middle class. That way the economy works for what? Everybody. And when that happens, what happens? Everybody wins. The poor people win. The middle class wins. And the rich people win. Maybe not in the short term, but in the long term. That's what we got to focus on. Oh, but, but Mike, did you just make a case for wealth redistribution? Yes. No. But that's – that's – that's but, but, socialism. We don't do that here in America. What are you talking it, about? Like here, here's my here's my overall point. It, like the elderly had the biggest um, increase uh, or decrease in poverty, but they created a program that when you put in money, you get three times as much as you put back. So because of an was, unsustainable, was it always three times or three times. Well, that's what it is now, back, and that's, or is it because health costs have climbed by three times? Well, they or buy a lot more. They 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 climb faster, but but you had a small improvement See? in children, and certain benefits help you when you have kids under eighteen, right? So you can give some credit there. But for the vast majority of poor people, like that that solid like ten percent of eighteen to eighteen to um to sixty four, like they remain pretty unchanged, and they're more they're more subject to the economy. And there was a war. It was supposed to be a war on poverty. Like not a war on everything. Well, like, sure. well, not I, a war on. I, I agree with you. I think there should have been much more focus on the middle class because the middle class builds the economy for everybody. If I'm look, I'm in a middle class family. If I get more money, if I if I get the money, what am I going to do? I'm going to spend it on like goods and services provided to me by poor Americans, and I'm going to go to the you know the national chain grocery stores and maybe eat at some fast food restaurants, maybe go to take my family to Chili's. It works for everybody. We have to be smarter. We have to we have to look at the bigger picture. If we're only focused on like oh no no, no. We, we we can only we, we can only do it like this because if we do it like this then if if we don't do it like this then we're uh, getting away from our principles. That's not the right way to look at it. Nope. But I th I think your overall premise is wrong. Like yeah, you I'm just saying that like, those are the numbers for the for how the war on poverty worked here. Oh, okay, but, so, like, so what if, what what were the years actually? When did that start? You said that started like around. In they the started 70s, keeping right? record right. in '59 of poverty stats, and what I have here is 22.4 percent. And then when they started the war on poverty, which is around '64, was uh it went down. It already went down to 19 percent. Okay, but you're talking uh, Sean, about the, the unchanged 18 to 64, right? Would you say – would you agree with me to say that a war on poverty is as stupid as a war on drugs? Absolutely not. No. Okay, it, it, so – We're getting to subjective terms really because really the, what the war – supposed war on poverty is is creating those programs that actually help to fight poverty. <laughs> 
So yeah. what you're really arguing is sort of semantics when it comes to, you know, what it's called. But I wanted to go back to Sean's uh, 18 to 18 to 64 year old, year olds that you said that poverty the poverty rate within them is unchanged. Well, I got from I think the from from Reagan on I think that there was more of a um, more of a, a social stigma put on people who want who needed to use the welfare system, especially within those brackets of 18 probably 18 to 24 year olds. Those are considered. Oh, you're, it's that young buck that's in there with their food stamps. What are you the doing? The fictional in there? welfare queen was part the, of his campaign. Ex exactly, exactly, and that's that's so that's like sort of that stigma where that would make it so that the poverty rate wouldn't decrease because these people would feel alienated and say, "Well, obviously, I don't want to be considered that. I can, I, you know what? I'm a rugged individual. I can make it on my own. It's going to be super tough, but I can do it." And I'm not going to take these government programs, and I'm going to stay poor. And essentially, that's what happens. Well, I want to I want to just uh, throw out throw out this uh, the study and the source right quick while I have mm -hmm. it. Um, it's it's uh, what you call it. It's welfare's effect on poverty, and it comes from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And the data actually comes from the Luxembourg uh, Income Study. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. But I, I, um, what you call, which is a separate study, they just, you know, took out data and matched the years. So it's somebody else analyzing somebody else's numbers, which makes me uncomfortable citing it. But um, I do it nonetheless. But um, if the, my my overall point is, I actually don't agree with the the argument that income distribution works. Like you can look at the countries that we gave um, uh, foreign aid to. And they're pretty much the same as they were when we started. And you compare BS. it to countries in general. Cool. In general, we give a lot of foreign aid to the Middle East. We give a lot of foreign aid to countries in Africa, and they don't improve. But if you look Berlin at Berlin countries... airlift, compare East Berlin to West Berlin. No, I mean that's Tell me that comparing something that's a hundred percent government controlled with a more free and open society. But my point is, if you compare them to like countries like Hong Kong or or New Zealand or Chile in Latin America. Those countries that embrace more free market reforms, like those countries are increasing in wealth. If China's wealth actually tracks with when they established property rights, which was in the mid 90s, the average wealth of a Chinese citizen was very, very low, and then they established property rights and they they start going up. So the basic fundamentals of capitalism, the right to own property, the right to trade and, and go, enter into contracts from each other, are essential for economic growth because just yeah, and think about no it. No one's arguing against that. Yeah, no, nobody's that's arguing against that kind that's of property completely, rights. That, that goes right back to my point about the Berlin airlift and East Berlin versus West Berlin, where you've got a capitalist society that's being enforced by a robust government policy to help build it. It does great. Where you've got a completely government-owned policy, it collapses. It, and, yeah. it, so no one's arguing for communism. We're arguing for capitalism with a government that is fighting for the people and is made of the people and by the people. But you know, but it, it's, it's like that mixed market economy, and it, it mixed market economies always tend to work because you take care of your vulnerable and you take care of your sick, but you also allow people to be capitalists and to invest in a capitalist economy, and and, and in order to have that growth, so you can have the best of both worlds. Yes. It's a balance, and, that, and that's often more successful. And, and you know, balance is kind of a really important thing when it comes to, I think, a lot of different issues coming together yeah. and taking the best ideas from both sides. That's and this whole I'm conversation, this whole conversation, is an example of how just fickle politics are. Because what, what, what everybody, I, uh, you know, I'm sorry if I'm misrepresenting you here, Sean. What everybody except for Sean is arguing here is a balanced approach. And keep in mind that in whatever Eisenhower, uh, the last Republican president to balance a budget, was in power, the tax on the upper class, on the highest income bracket was 90%. Right. But that today you would be a raging liberal. You couldn't even pass in the Democratic Party today with that kind of tax policy. What we're arguing for is a position that is strengthened with historical data of capitalism, but capitalism that is backed by a government that is there to fight on behalf of the people that it is made up for. And we certainly don't have that today mm -hmm. with soups and all that good stuff. Hey, thanks for watching this video. Please leave a comment below 
And if you enjoyed this video, make sure to hit the like button and share with your friends. If you want to see more, go to our channel at youtube.com slash TYTNation. And if you really want to support the show, support this channel, go to our fundraising campaign at www.patreon.com slash TYTNation. The website is in the description below. Thank you guys and keep watching.